have a specific question or something sparks in your head like, oh shit, I came across this before, feel free, we'll add to that list. Batch tank maintenance? Batch or, tank? Yeah, maintenance of uh, all like, like all your, all your, your like your, uh, your, uh, your dose trons and... Yeah, yeah, or just uh, RO tank, what you recommend, uh, Zoom, just to keep it clean. And yep, we're going to talk about that. Um, CO2 environment differentials. Uh, like, do you know honey, honey did, like, honey did, like, that, do you know, like, uh, certain, like, phenotype? Oh, phenols? Like, 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 phenol hunting? Yeah. Like, honey did, like, keeper? Yeah, for sure. <laughs> Alright. Alright, so, I'll let perform and introduce myself. My name's Dylan. Um, uh, I go by Midmaster Online. Uh, that's, that's, it's, uh, story behind that, so you guys just know that's, um, like a joke between my wife and I, like a sexual joke between my wife and I. So um, does not think mean that I think I'm a master by any means. I'm not. Um, I've been cultivating for you know 20 some years. Um, I started on Fox Farm uh, soil with Tiger Bloom. You know, um, it's a joke between my friends and I. You know, it's like we talk about the Tiger Bloom turps. Um, you know, I mean, I started. You know, cultivating. If anybody's been cultivating that long, you know, like there was no Reddit, there was no YouTube, there was no Instagram. There, were, you you went to a grow store, and if you mentioned cannabis, they had you a card, and they could no longer talk to you. Right? You could, they couldn't. You you couldn't shop. You could look. But they couldn't answer any questions. Right? Um, so I, I I've been through all the different stages in, in Michigan's market, from highly illegal to to where it is now. Right? Um, to a time when you sweated about having a you know. Uh, an eighth of AK-47 when you were driving because you, you were looking at jail time to drive with 50 pounds in your car and forgetting it's in the trunk. You know what I mean? Um, so it's it's definitely been a it's it's a lot different, right? Um, and uh, you know we'll we'll start a little bit just by touching on like the market because I know I, I hear a lot of buzz about that and a lot of people freaking out and like you know you got to remember um, you know back then when there was a lot of risk. It, you know, to, to cultivating, right? Like you were looking at a lot of time for what most of us do now that, I mean, we don't, we don't even think about in our sleep, right? Um, so when the risk was high, the reward was really high. You know, when you're, we were getting four or $5,000 a pound, there was a lot of risk associated with that, right? Now that there's not a lot of risk, and most people I know don't even follow plant count, have a caregiver license, don't give a shit, have buy places, it's just blown out because there's no risk, right? And when there's no risk or low risk, your, place, your prices reflect that, right? Because everybody and their brother is doing it because there's no risk. Um, so that hand in hand is why the market is where it's at, right? Um, and, and most of us knew this was coming for a long time. <clears throat> um, you know, we watched the same things happen in Washington, Oregon, California, and now Michigan and all the other states that come online will soon to follow. Um, you know, at some point, there's gonna be no more outlets for your flower in, when every state comes online. That's just the you know, I mean, everybody's everybody's flower goes to markets that are still restricted and still, you know, held down by the law and, and not as um, legal as, as it is in Michigan and other states. You know, so what I always just tell everyone is like, you know, this is the time, you know, in the depression when it's when the prices are down like this, you know, to, to work on your craft because fire will always sell at the end of the day. You know, we can roll this into what you said about with with phenotypes. You know. Um, you know, if you guys, so we'll take a strain like my homie Jay strain Super Boof, great cut. Uh, you know, I can't sell a pack of Super Boof if you gave it to me for $100. I can't sell it. And because, why? Why? Because it's everywhere, everywhere. right? And so, and, and uh, it's a great cut. It, but if you have the same phenol as everyone else, what do you have to offer that's different? You have nothing. You guys all come to me with Super Boof. And, and, I'm, and I got $1,000 to spend, I'm gonna whittle, one of you guys is gonna sell it to me and I'm gonna go as low as I can, you know what I mean? And But if you come to me with a gelato, back cross of super boot, back cross of something else that you bred or hunted or, or found, and it's, I can't get it anywhere else, now you, you, you I only can, I'm gonna give you whatever I want, want for that pack, right, within, within reason. You don't have any competition, right? So I'm a big proponent of that, um, I see a lot of, you know, I'm in the market a lot in Michigan on the streets and in the in the legal market, right? And um, I do a lot of work in, in commercial facilities as well. And it's the same struggle in commercial facilities. Everybody runs Motor Breath 15. Every facility I go to in the state of Michigan runs Motor Breath 15. So if you're a dispensary and everybody is coming to you 
there's what 700 and some licensed facilities in the state of Michigan as of today. Seven, or just over 700 with another couple hundred being built up, right? So if you're if you're if you're a dispensary owner, right, or which is the same thing as a broker, right, in the black market, and everybody's coming to you with Motor Breath 15, there's what what makes your it's not special, right? So um, now is the time to work on your craft, try to set yourself apart with your flower, try to set, set yourself apart with phenotypes, right, hunting. Um, you know, I personally uh, try to stay ahead of, you know, the, it, there's, as long as I can remember, from the west to the east, the trends have always been set. So whatever's cool out in California, slowly trickles over here, right? Like RS11, they just did a huge drop, Rainbow Sherbert number 11, and uh, everybody, from you know Midwest over, just you know drop t stupid money to get this cut, and the guys out in California are laughing because they've had it in circulation for two years and like you guys, just so far behind the times, right? So if I'm looking at like, what am I hunting? What am I looking into? I'm looking at like, what are they doing in California right now? Because it's gonna come this way, right? So me personally, going back to a lot of Z turps, a lot of Skittles crosses, you know, we've seen a wave of going from, you know bag appeal for years nothing but bag appeal purple and bag appeal only didn't care about nose didn't care about taste didn't care, nothing but bag appeal now we're seeing a trend finally come back to where you know ogs are coming back you know turps are coming back people want you know be, because there's so many people growing and people are getting picky now and weed is 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 cheaper right so people are getting a little bit more picky and they're actually getting a little bit more educated i think as well you know you can only smoke you know uh Bubba packs for so long before you just, you know, um, you are like, I'm, I'm good on this, right? So, um, you know, as far as hunting, I would, you know, wherever your market's at, wh whatever your people are asking for, listen to that as well. I always have my ears open um, to my patients, right? Like, wh what do you what do you want? You know, like, what are you after? I mean, I I like OGs. If anybody knows me, mostly all I smoke is San Fernando Valley OG. That's almost all I smoke, you know? Um, and I have some other stuff that I that I found that I like too, but I like I like funk, foul, and OGs. I'm not a fruit guy. I, I candy's all right. And that's I'm just talking about me personally. But I grow a lot of that stuff because that's what's in demand, right? So I think a big part of phenol hunting is looking at what's big out west and talking with your patients or whoever that is. What are they What are they wanting? What are they reaching for? And then trying to stay ahead of that curve. You know, I just think. Uh, you know, if, if any of you guys, any of you guys buy a Zolympic box or you see the, the Zolympics in Michigan recently, um, had a lot of my friends <clears throat> that run a lot of those um, facilities that were entered in that. And uh, if you, so so like out of all the entries, I think like 80% of that box was just rebranded runs, name runs, right? So that tells you where Michigan's market's at with genetics. If the best facilities in Michigan, the best thing they got to put in a box is runs and call it something else, that tells you where Michigan's at with genetics. Pretty poor. You know, um, because I think a lot of people are stuck in the same mindset. I know I was gu guilty for years. I just was too concerned about like pounds, flour, and I just, you know, I, I just, whatever was biggest yielding or, you know, grams per square foot. And I, I never put time into shutting rooms down to like hunt seeds or, you know, try to do something on my own. It was just getting clones from everybody else. And for, for a long time that worked, but now, you know, that, the, the general general populated flower that you can get everywhere just doesn't move, you know? I mean, I have a lot of friends that are slowly starting to realize that. I realized that a few years ago. I'm like, I can't, I gotta differentiate myself, right? So I think that's huge. Um, that's one way to make it through the market and just working on your skills, man. You know, I mean, fire will always sell, always. Like, guys, I know there's a lot of people struggling right now and like there's they're, they're, the market is completely saturated white market and black market and it's but it's saturated with average ass work flour. It is not saturated with fire. You know, I, I had some friends in town from Tennessee last week. I didn't have anything and I had to go out and try to find like some fire. I went to ten or fifteen different places and I couldn't find anything that was up to my standards. Right? So like to try to find a nice crafted bag of fire is hard. It is not but if you just want some average work, it's everywhere, right? So um, I think this is perfect time to mm -hmm. just try to hone those skills in. You know what I mean? Set yourself apart. So that's my little piece on that. Um, so yeah, first thing I'd like to get into is, um, <clears throat> you know, I, I wanted to get in into, um, you know, PM management. 
both. Anybody growing outdoor here this year? Yeah. Green, greenhouse or just regular outdoor? Just regular outdoor. Yeah. Regular outdoor? Yeah, I grew in uh, Michigan outdoor market for years, right? So um, outdoor pests and, and, and mildew are very similar. The conditions are always the same to spark powder mildew. Um, and there's, you know, a lot of debates, but my experience has been that, you know, powder mildew is 100% environmental. Now, if you get a clone from somebody that's already got powder mildew, well, you're already starting off on the wrong foot. Um, but powder mildew is 100% environmental. Powder mildew loves, can anyone tell me what it loves? Cold and humid. It loves cold and humid. Cold and humid. So, if you have a room, it typically we're always going to see this indoor. When are we going to see this most likely? Nighttime. Nighttime, specifically right at lights off. Yeah, yeah. Yep. So indoor, you're going to see the lights off. Why? It gets cold. It gets cold and transpiration and your lights go off, humidity surges, everything's ACs are turning on, the, the DHUs can't keep up with that spike and usually what we'll always see it lights off, right? It lights off is just a with your humidity and then the temperatures are going down like that. Everything's all, all messed up. So I guess my point with all this and outdoor is the same. When do we see, when do you start seeing PM outside? I've never had a problem outside. It's just insane. So... I've always had a problem in Michigan's outdoor environment. It's I was because about right now because right now it, it, it's like 85 during the day, 90 during the day, and then at nighttime it goes down to 50. Yup, so you're exactly right. So you're, you're if you guys start looking at your weather app every year, and this is why like for outdoor, back to what you brought up about phenos, you better, if you want to take outdoor seriously, you better be hunting the right phenos. Pest resistant, mold resistant, I have a few of them. The only ones I'll put outside Early still, finishers. you know. Early, early finisher is important too, and just really that, you know, something that can stand up to the unavoidable PM that you will see at some point if you're going to uh, into October in Michigan for sure. And it's because in September is usually when I start to see it, end of, end of August, if we get some, we will get some cold nights, and we'll get these nights where it goes down to 40, 50 degrees. I, 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 I 50 the other day. And then, and then if, you look at, if, if you look at your weather app, it'll be 50 degrees and like 95% humidity. Go plug that in a KPA calculator. <laughs> I mean, it's like, and, that's, and so indoors, we see that same thing of lights off. We'll see this huge spike of like, you know, the AC, it's going down from 80 to 70. Your humidity spikes up to 90. And as soon as you have your temperatures go higher than your humidity, or I mean, I'm sorry, your humidity go higher than your temperatures, you're, you're, that is, you're at risk. So indoors, um, so indoors, you know what I like to um, what I like to suggest, and is um, about an hour. Or so I use uh, regular. I take one hour before lights off. One hour before lights off. I like to start dropping everything down. So I don't wait till lights off. To start dropping my temperatures to my night setting or dropping my humidity. I do that an hour before lights off. My room, as my lights are starting to dim down, right, on a, on a night setting or whatever, an hour before I start bringing my, my temps down from, let's say, 80 to 74. So I bring my temps down, I bring my RH down, so that when the lights go off, that climate's already set. It's not going all out of control. What are you controlling your rooms with? I use, so my D hues are all controlled with Trollmaster, most, most of my rooms. Um, That's what and I, was asking, I just know that they only pretty much have like a day night setting. Right. So you're um, you're you can you can set it up if you use you have to plug you have to plug the um, you have to plug it into or run it off of the program device station. Okay. So the, you, there is a way to make it work. The biggest thing is I I, I don't use Trollmaster to control my 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 temperature. So so an hour I use regular on the wall. Honeywell Oxy stats where I can program my time. An hour before lights off, I'm taking all that down. Now, if you're working on uh, Trollmaster Pro, you can do all this right in the Trollmaster Pro. You can, and that's the difference between the two. Um, I don't like to promote Trollmaster too much because I've had issues with them, but the Pro are, is dialed in. You can, you can literally, you can take the graph and put your finger on it. You can change your, your settings 100 times during the day or night to whatever you want. 
Um, so there are, there's a lot of different options out there. You can go just traditional wall mounted and in humidistats or Honeywell thermostats for your air handlers or just go with something like the, um, the Trollmaster Pro. Um, the, the original Trollmaster is pretty hard to, to do any of that with. Um, you can make it work by using a program device station and plugging some of that stuff into there. Uh, but even then it can be a little a little tricky. Because it requires wiring. Yeah. Most people get to that part of the but, the, the, but this has, this has, so, so like, the biggest issues I've ever had indoor PM has always been, um, I'm not a, and I know we all use them, I still use them, but I hate mini splits. Um, mini splits are really hard, like in smaller rooms, I get it, you can't justify buying an air handler and getting a bigger, a bigger HVAC system. Um, really hard to control swings. Um, you know, typically I'm a huge proponent in rooms of setting up multiple heads if you're using a mini split. So if you needed 3,000, you know, 3,000 BTUs of cooling in your room, I would get two uh, one and a half ton air handlers with separate condensers. That way you can control them, you can offset them a little bit, and you can keep the waves from happening in your room. Um, if you're if you're able to and you can afford it, you know, if you're going over, you know, two tons, I would suggest that you can just getting an air handler much more consistent than a, than a mini split system and a lot more, a lot less maintenance and headache um, long term. Um, but if you're going with mini splits and the same thing goes for DUs, I always, I always try to push doing multiple. So uh, DUs especially. So if you needed, you know, 400 pints of dehumidification in your room, if that's what your calculation added up to. I would suggest going with, instead of going with a bigger unit, um, I would go with like, you know, multiple smaller units. That way you can zone it in your room and you can have them offset by a few points and really control those waves. Because if you have, you know, just one DU but, and they go into cold start, right? Um, and hot start delay. So they'll, they'll, and I've seen this a hundred times in my, old, in my own rooms. If you have one DU and it takes your humidity down to 60 degrees or 60 you know, degrees um, or percent, RH and then it shuts off, it goes into hot start delay. It will not fire again. I think it's three minutes. Three minutes. Yeah, three minutes. So your humidity just spikes way back up and you play this constant game of this on your graphs. And that's what you want to avoid for temperature and humidity. You want to look on your graph and see it as close to straight as you can. So that that's huge. It's a, a huge thing I see even in commercial. We we'll go to a lot of commercial rooms and I'm like, they got like, you know, two huge dehumidifiers. And if you look on their graph, they're just, they're waving all over. We're, I'm, I'm a proponent of multiple smaller units. So if, even if that um, wavy line represents one KPA and 1.3 KPA, like that difference, it's still just not good. What's that? Like the KPA, say like at the bottom is one, at the top is 1.3. Yep. Is that so you don't want that at all? I mean, yeah, within well, reason, right? Small. I mean, you know, like when I say wave, I'm talking like, I don't want to go from like, if I'm in early stretch, I'm trying to keep it around one, and I'm spiking up to 1.3, 1.4, 1.5. I mean, for me, like no, I, I minutes, want to yeah. keep that. I want to keep that as close to straight. I mean, realistically, I've never seen my grass be perfectly straight, but they're, you know, they're like this. Right. You know, they're they're very close to. And again, at lights off is the biggest time you're going to see those spikes occur. And if you're if you're not offset with with uh, dehumidification in your rooms, you'll see that you'll see that constantly. So. Most of my rooms, I have two to three DUs, and my average room size is about a 20 lighter. <coughs> so um, most spots, we have them zoned, um, and we'll have, if we have one DU set at 60%, you know, we'll have the next one set at 58%. If I have two, so let's say that's a day setting, and then the night setting is 55%, this one will be 53%. So the delta between the two is still the same, we're five degrees. This acts as the, where I'm trying to keep it, and this keeps it from never going over that, right? So I'm keeping it within two points. And you can do this with as many DUs as you want. Again, if you're using something like Trollmaster Pro, you're able to zone your rooms. Um, bigger rooms, we have them set up on zones. So we may have three dehumidifiers acting at this set point, three acting at that set point. So Where do you like to see your swing at the highest, lowest? For, for humidity, humidity at night, yeah. At night, I mean, it depends on depends on where I'm at. Five, eight, um, what's that? Between the five and eight percent. Yeah, I mean, I don't really want to see. Usually, if I'm offsetting these two points, I never see more than two to three points. It will stay within that range. It can control it 100 percent. Because when this shuts off, and let's say it shuts off at 58, if I see a spike, as soon as it hits 60, this kicks on. 
this bank hit, hit, hit 61 before it's starting to bring it down. And when that brings it back down, now this is reset on its hot start delay, right? So that's ready to go. So when this one shuts off and it starts to creep back up, this one's immediately gonna turn back on. So in most of my rooms, there's this DU's running constantly. Okay. And that also allows the HVAC to fight that heat consistently instead of diving down cold with, by having your HVAC turn on when now all of a sudden there's no heat from the DU's. And, and so, uh, you know, you really, you really want your HVAC and your DU's almost working all the time. You know, the only places I've seen in the commercial that do a really good job with mini splits are where they just have tons of heads and they just, they, they can almost get to a point where everything negates each other. HVAC's running almost, those mini splits are running all the time. DU's are running all the time and it just stays stable. So, yeah. So that, that's just one of the hugest ways to combat powder mildew. It's your 100% environment for, for, and from my experience. Um, now that's, again, I've got nasty clones for people. And I think we all have, um, which leads to, you know, the, the biggest fight against PM is right here, sulfur. Wet, wettable micronized sulfur is the number one thing for PM control in, in my experience. Um, there's other products up here that work well, um, but typically if I'm bringing in, and this is probably a good thing to talk about, you know, what are, what are your guys' um, you know, processes for bringing in a, a clone? Let's say you go get a clone from someone. Don't. Quarantine. Don't. Somebody said don't. don't. It's a good idea, too. Quarantine. I, I, think, I think we all have, and uh, I think we all have, and I see a lot of people that, that still do this frequently, and they, they end up with a lot of problems. And, you know, somebody said the word already, but let's talk about quarantine. So... Um, Sulfur dunks, probably the number one thing that I use all the time. Um, I have, I have moms that are outside. I, I for years have taken cuts from outside. I have no issue doing that as long as my SOPs are in place. Um, I don't, you know, I and I'm following a good dunk procedure. A wettable sulfur dunk is gonna kill almost 90% of whatever could be be harming you from from mites to um to PM. It's the number one, uh, you know, killer against powder mildew for sure. Now the thing about sulfur is you don't want to spray it past about day 13, 14 of flower. If you spray it past day 13 or 14 of flower, your chances of, of having um, hermaphrodite, her, her, herm issues in your rooms go up like about 90%. Um, you know, so in veg, and usually I stop about day 10. Um, and uh, I usually do <coughs> sulfur once a month in veg. I dunk every clone that I've ever taken from anyone. I don't care if it's my best friend who I know has a great program, program or if it's somebody I don't know. Um, I don't take in a lot of cuts anymore, but when I do, I always use a sulfur dunk. How long are you dunking for? Um, about 20 seconds, fully submerged, you know, 20 to 30 seconds. And I like to use yucca or, you got cocoa wet here? Yeah. I think, mm -hmm. yeah, cocoa wet. Mm -hmm. oh, any kind of type of wetting agent to get that stuff to stick. And then obviously you wanna let that dry before you put it back in direct light. Mm -hmm. I usually set it off and. In, the, in just the side lighting, you know, no direct light. Same thing with any of these IPM products. Um, I brought up a lot of stuff that I personally use or have used in the past. Sulfur is a huge one. Um, I love sulfur, especially for outside. For outdoor, if you're going outside, heavy sulfur um, up until, like like I said, about day 10 to 14 of flowers, about the last time you want to apply. Um, sulfur is also the number one thing to use against russet mites, hemp mites. Um, any kind of mice, specifically the russet mite, um, it's my go-to. That with a combination of another oil product like Pure Crop or Athena IPM um, in conjunction. You have to be very careful when you use sulfur and any oil-based product because you will, um, you, you can really dust a crop fast, uh, phototoxicity. So if you're, when you use sulfur, if you're going to go back to using another oil-based product, you have to wash that plant. Um, so typically if I, when I've dealt with like a russet infestation, um, or russet, like any kind of russet activity. It's sulfur, usually every other day for three applications. And then we'll do like just an RO wash or we'll use uh, something like, um, you know, a light cleanse, cleanse in there solution as well, or just RO and we'll do a foliar for two days in a row where we wash that plant and then we'll go back to our normal uh, oil-based product. So, um, and that's, that's a great combo to use for outdoors. So, um, that's the biggest thing for PM, environmental, and then when you have PM or when you see it spark up, it's combating it. Now somebody mentioned late flower PM. That is, 
you know, I have my own personal opinion on that. Personally, if I see powder mildew late flower, I just trash my room, throw it away. Um, I, I can't sell flour to my patients that have been sprayed with shit late flour. I just, I just know. Now I know that everybody's in that same position, and I have sprayed plenty of flour, late flour. Um, I've just seen the effects of it on the flour, and you're, you're, you're not going to have uh, very good flour. You start spraying your actual flours with. You're going to have to use an oil-based product. Sulfur is not an issue at that point. Um, you can use H2O2. You know, there's a. You can use um, isopropyl alcohol. Use Banish. What's that? Banish. Banish. Yeah. I haven't used Banish. Um, I don't know a lot of. If you look at the ingredients on a lot of the containers, a lot of the stuff's the same. Now I don't know about that product. I just pulled some stuff up here that I have used in the past. Um, usually late flower. All the oil products, Crop Control, Athena IPM, uh, what else, the Pure Crop One, I mean, they're all very similar. And they're all going to keep your powder mill, they're gonna kill what's on the leaf, um, but they're, it's just gonna keep coming back. There's nothing you can do at that point unless you wanna go fully systemic, pesticide, which I would not recommend. Um, you know, that, that flower, at that, that point, is just poisoning, right? So. Late flower, it's really tough. Um, you know, I would suggest stripping everything down. If you start to see it week six, week seven, as soon as you see it, strip it off. As soon as you see it, and again, it's not gonna fix it. It's in the plant at that point. Um, you know, making sure your environment's on point will keep it from spreading as fast. And I think late flower, it's more about trying to slow the spread as opposed to trying to kill it, because you're not gonna kill it at that point, unless you use a harmful pesticide, right? Um, so plucking, plucking it off as soon as you see it, and if it gets out of control, last resort is gonna be going to a spray. Last resort is gonna be going to a spray. And, and if you guys are processing, you know, I, I, I personally would just put most of that to oil if you have to save it. Um, I don't even recommend that. I'm just weird with, with that kind of stuff, with molds and mildews. Um, but, um, you know, PM late flower's tough, man, it's tough. You think that's a mainly environmental thing? Because it like yeah. that. It's environmental. Seven, it's yeah, it's environmental. Like so so what we'll see a lot <clears throat> back to that graph. Just always remember cold temperatures, high humidity. And typically when we go late into flower, week seven, week eight, week nine, you're you're trying to take your temperatures and your humidity down, right? And you know you uh, most grows I've been in, they try to take their temperatures down because they think that like seventy percent and you know seventy degrees and sixty or 58% humidity is is, um, is conducive. And if you look in a chart, you're still riding that line. Yeah. I mean, I, I I personally, from week seven on, I wanna be in the 40s on RH. You know, yeah. I tank everything down because I'm trying to bring my temps down. And when you try to bring your temps down, you have to make sure that your HVAC, or your, your, your HVAC, meaning your AC and your DHUs are capable of going that low. Most places I've been to are not capable of bringing their, their humidity down as low as they think. They can take their temperatures down, but if you can't bring that humidity down in parallel, you know, in parallel, you're going to run into those issues, especially at nighttime. Yeah. When you're running 75 during the day and you're trying to go to 65 at night, and that then lights go off, that humidity at this point, you got your room is full of moisture saturated flowers, yeah. and it just it spikes, right? Yeah. So if you're not able, it's better to not take your temperatures. If you're, you know, a lot of, oh, I gotta, I gotta take my temperature, I need purple, purple. And it's like, you, you'd rather just keep your temperatures a little warmer to where your, your humidity can, you know, go down, as opposed to trying to take your temperatures down if your HVAC can't handle it. Because the lower you go in temperatures, the less pints per hour your DUs can take out. Yeah, I, I think most of us know that. But at that point, like when that was all happening, I quit even taking my temperature down because I figured it was probably just the vegetation with buds and everything just being mm -hmm. saturated with moisture. Yep. That was you were having a problem at nighttime getting that humidity down. I mean, airflow is another thing that I think we all, you know, we all want good airflow. We don't want stagnant air. You know, I mean, you got to think about all the microclimates that can be happening in your room. Um, you know, I, I've been in a lot of big rooms commercial wise and, and caregiver wise, I, the bigger rooms are always the ones that struggle. You know, there's so many microclimates. I mean, double decks scare the shit out of me when I go to these places and I see two or three, four stacks high and I'm just going and, I, and I've and i seen a lot of powder mill doing in, in double deck because it's so hard to control every cubic foot of that room to the proper VPD. I mean, it's it, there's a lot of factors. Airflow is a huge one, especially with the bigger rooms you go, you gotta have proper airflow because yeah your your humidity and your VPD and temperature at the canopy may be may be great but inner canopy is just 
it's moist and humid. Plucking, plant maintenance, another huge thing that goes into this, right? If you have a nice thinned out canopy and you know you're you have good air movement through that canopy, I mean plucking leaves is not just to try to get more weight. It's it's to it's to keep good airflow through your rooms. Do you have the proper you know fans? Um, I personally use a lot of Ostermans in my room, and I want them pulling from the ground up through the canopy. You know, I mean, I used to just do all the hurricane style fans, which those are great. They keep air moving good, but they blow on your plants, and it's the under canopy that usually needs a lot of a lot of air, especially in bigger rooms. So air control, air airflow is huge. You know, you want to maintain you know, a very good controlled environment throughout that entire room. Um, another common <clears throat> common thing I see um, is, and, and typically it's mini splits, and guys that pipe in air handlers and have the piping running in the room, so they'll have the registers or the mini splits just blowing right on their plants. You gotta figure if that, if that register or mini splits blown out, let's say 58 degree air, right, onto your plant, right onto a cola, right onto the canopy, and it's 70% humidity, even though your room temperatures are 80, but at that spot, that's not, it's, I, if you see problems, typically every time I see a bad patch of PM, it's right underneath registers, because you got cold air, your airflow is not good, just blowing right onto to one spot. Right. You know, I literally saw it start in a room, like, they had mini splits on one side of the room, and, you know, they had the air coming down and blowing onto this, can't the root, their plants got a little too tall, so it was right in front of the airflow, that cold air, and it was just, it all started right down that side. Even though his rest of the room was controlled, at that point it wasn't. So what we did to fix that is we put um, some Schaefer air handlers right in front of those mini splits uh, against the wall. So when that air came out, it was immediately getting moved instead of being able to hit that canopy. Nice. So, uh, real quick on the on the dehumidification, mm -hmm. you know, I was running a Quest Q25 on a 12 light room. Yep. Um, you know, I noticed at night it was just chugging. You know, just didn't it, it weeks. Five, six, seven, it just never shut off. And, and I, you know, the math, I was close, but at the end of the day, once I put another 225 in there, I was over, you know, a lot over than what I needed, but it controlled it so much more better with the. Yeah. Yeah. So, like, nighttime, when you go below like 74 degrees, really, on, in, in a room, DQs, the amount that they put off, it, all those Quest units, all the Andon units, up into the 335 or the 320s, well, those lower model units, and I run a lot of 165s and 225s, they're all rated right those pints per gallon at 80 degrees. As soon as you go below 80, brother, your pints are, I, I forget what the 225 at like 70, it's like it's like less than half of what it's actually rated for. So when you start going down at 60, into the night. At 68 degrees and 40% uh, humidity, it's only pulling, um, oh, it's at 68 degrees, it's only pulling uh, 60 pints per day. Yeah, yeah. So, that, that's where being overkill. So typically, like all my 20 light rooms, I have three to four 225s in and, and it because I'm good until the end of flower. Week six, seven, and eight, I need all of those because they're not pulling. You know, when it, when I'm beginning a flower, it's 85 degrees in my LED rooms, one 225, it'll, it'll, it'll work just fine. And as I move later, start dropping that temp down below 80, I need all those extras um, to really come online to keep it where I want. I've learned, I've definitely learned the hard way. You know, I mean, I, I learned, this is all what I've learned through experience throughout the years. I've had plenty of PM and, you know, I just went overkill with one unit, was running a lot of mini splits, and my shit was just all over the place. All over the place. So. You know, when you hear people say, like, dial in your room, this is like the importance that we stress. If you're going to think about growing indoors, if you don't dial in your room to a point like that, then you might as well not put plants in there until you feel like it's ready, because problems will come if that room is not dialed in. Yeah, so. it's, 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 and sometimes a lot of it, you know, typically if I build a new room, I want to be able to, like, well, like I'm, I'm building out a couple of rooms right now, and, you know, typically what I do is when we get ready to move in, when we're done, done building out, we set that room and let it run for a week. I want to see it at 80, 60, all over different temperatures. I want to make sure before I bring plants into his point, especially in this market, right? Back to what we talked about, I can't have failed runs. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like you can't have, you know, issues. And I'm, I would rather take an extra month to make sure everything's dialed in before I, I bring everything in. So test fire your rooms. 
If you're doing work or redoing something, take it down to 70. See where your humidity's at. You know what I mean? Yes, obviously it's going to change when you have plants in there. Your transpiration humidity is going to be higher, but at 70 degrees, you should still be able to get your humidity down to 50% with an empty room during the summer. And if you can't, you know you're not special. You're not going to be able to do that when you get plants in there. You know. So, so when giving people advice, you think we you should advise to double the dehumidification? I y yeah. I mean, for the most part, I mean, you're doing your normal calculations. You know, okay, you're going to figure out how many how many gallons you're feeding per day, right? That's the typical way you figure out how many you need. If you're feeding 100 gallons a day, you know, that's eight. What is that? Eight. 800 pints. You could do the math of what you need, but that's not enough. That's not enough. That's that's enough for the beginning of flower, but I'm always going to add on at least 50 percent more. And now I just, if I can get the prices are right, I'll double up, 100 percent. LEDs especially. HPS a different ball game. HPS rooms you have a different issue. Who here runs HPS? Okay, I run both. Right. DEs you come in super dry. Early flower, right? You bring in new clones. When the lights are on, I need humidifiers. Now we're, we're struggling in. We have a different issue, right? We have to run humidifiers. And at night is the only time you really need that extra humidity and that extra 50 or 100% is always going to come at night, typically later flower. DEs, you won't see as much issues with lights on. Those DEs just dry the air right out. You know, I mean, uh, you'll start to need them a little bit. A little bit about week two, week three of flower during the day. Um, but mostly at night. Are you guys switching? Are you working a little more with HPS? I've always ran HPS. Um, we got into, I mean, most of us been growing. I've been growing LEDs for four years. Um, try a lot, try a lot new. I just, you know, my, I, I, I just don't see the same quality coming off LEDs. And I got you know three rooms, I mean? LED, HPS, and the HPS is always. Yep. So like smacking. LEDs, biomass, by far, will crush an HPS. Like as far as biomass. Um, don't get me wrong, I, I get good flour, but if I'm really being picky, and I'm especially looking at hash returns, you know what I mean? Same strain, same newts, same everything other than light, 2800 Kelvin is, is hard to beat, you know? Uh, I think that the LEDs will get there for sure. These companies are, ain't stupid. They, 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 they hear and see what's going on, and I think a lot we're seeing a lot of companies come out with new spectrums and there's always going more towards a red or more yellow spectrum. So, but right now I still, DE's king for quality, you know? But I mean, DE's also come at a huge expense. Twice the HVAC, you know what I mean, for sure. And about twice, literally twice the power bills, so. You're running 10 amps per unit. No, but it's what I like to smoke on. 9.6. What I like to smoke on. What's that? With more HVAC comes at some points with DEs, more humidification. Right, right. Yep. yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, that's, so yeah, I, that's my, my air handlers run nonstop in DE rooms. And so during the day, it's, you, you need humidifiers big time. You know what I mean? We usually have three or four in a 20 light double ended room running nonstop the first two weeks to keep that humidity at like 65% even, you know? Um, but yeah, PM in a nutshell though, it's environment in that just if there's anything you remember, it's cold. PM loves cold and humid. So you got it. Whatever you need to do in your rooms to keep it from getting cold and humid. If you walk in and like, you know, you want to be calibrating your sensors all the time in your rooms, but you know, we, we talk a lot about like the natural feel in a room. I, I, I can walk in right away and tell you the sensors on and off just because, you know, you've been in a lot of rooms, you can tell if you walk in and it feels like cold and balmy, you know, like a it's just a a wet Michigan basement, that like balmy cold PM, that's what PM loves. And if you walk into your room at any time, lights off, middle of the night, you know, when you walk in your room week eight, week nine of flower, and it's cold, I mean, I'll bring my rooms down to like 66, 67 degrees, and it's really cold, it should feel dry. You know, we all know what dry feels like, and if it doesn't feel like that, regardless of what your sensors are reading, you know, I suggest everyone, I don't know if they sell them here, but getting a fluke meter, they're not cheap. They run about five or six hundred dollars. They are the best meter to have for to calibrate all of your temp, all of your temp and RH sensors. So they are spot on. They're, they're higher end, but they work really well. Um, Troll Master is probably the number one thing that we use. A lot of growers, man, those sensors every week calibrate them. Every single week calibrate them. I, if you ever, if all my rooms, man, I have so many of the cheap Amazon. I'll buy every time I'm at the grocery store. I usually grab like five more sensors everywhere 
because like they're always off a little bit, but your natural feel in a room is huge. You've got to be going in the room at lights off and naturally feeling that spike as well. You know, like I, I literally have sat in a room for an hour, 30 minutes before lights off, 30 minutes after just standing there to feel what my body feels going through that transition where those spikes are occurring, you know, um, and making sure that your climate's controlled throughout that entire room. You know, airflow's huge. So making sure your cold air is dispersed throughout the room, wherever it's coming in, and the same thing for the heat. So, yep. um, I guess we'll talk, so real quick, while we're talking about that, let's talk about foliar feeding and pests in general. So foliar feeding for me, and when I say foliar feeding, that, that usually includes either just food for the plant or, 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 or uh, an IPM or both, right? Um, I, I, I am usually early stretch uh, a flower. I like to do a combination. Usually when I'm in veg, I separate the food from the IPM. Um, I also use a lot of beneficial insects. So how I apply things may be different than how you, how you apply things because I don't want to kill off my beneficial insects. So I kind of stagger everything. Um, I like to use cow mag, kelp, or it can be found in stack. Nectar for the Gods, Bloom Chaos is also a great foliar spray. I've used that for years. Um, I like to use kelp. Um, I like to use cow mag, and I like to use some sort of silica. A silitator or Power SI um, is a great source of, of general food for your plants. Um, Heavy 16 also makes a great foliar product. Um, it's full of calcium. Um, so I like to give my plants food and veg, <laughs> excuse me, usually about every two weeks. Uh, before I'm taking cuttings off moms, uh, we talked about mom maintenance a little bit. I like to spray my moms about seven to ten days with food before I'm going to take cuts. Um, that's just that's just what I like to do. Um, and for me, inside um, in my rooms, uh, Athena IPM. Before I, I used Athena IPM for years, this was my go-to. Pure Crop One. Um, it's a good base oil product. The plants love it. Um, and I personally foliar spray about every two weeks in my veg. Um, sulfur is my go-to for dunking, and sulfur is my go-to if I see any signs of mites, any signs of mites, um, this is my go-to. I, I haven't seen PM in my gardens in years, thank God. If I did, that would also be my go-to in veg. We're talking veg specific. Um, <clears throat> so every two weeks, and then my SOP is I spray, after I spray, I wait about a day or two, and I relay all my beneficials. I let them do what they do, and then every two weeks, take out all my sachets, reapply, IPM, and then um, every other week, I'm usually doing food. So I'll do food about every other week in veg, clones, seedlings, everything. The only thing I stop from, if I'm running uh, fem seeds, I do not hit them with food. Um, your herm rates are gonna go up through the roof. It's been proven over the years. A lot of people, if you see a lot, a lot of people that pop packs, they're like, oh, I got herms, herms, herms. If you talk to them, usually they're spraying a lot of food. And I've talked to a lot of breeders over the years that just said with fems, it's the nature of the feminized seed, keeping food off of them is the best for whatever reason. So I spray everything but fem seeds with food. Um, when I get into flour, I'm using the same products, uh, but I'm, I'm going to do a combination. I don't like to spray a lot, and I never spray past seeing pistols on plants. As soon as I see pistol formations, I'm done spraying. Um, I'm going to go to beneficials for the rest of the time as far as IPM. Um, and I'm going to use typically a, a combination of uh, an oil-based product, whether it's pure crop. This Be Safe is great. This is all I used outside for years. Um, Athena IPM, I mean, there's a whole smorgasbord sport of good oil-based IPM products over there. Um, and I'm going to combine that with a little bit of CalMag and a little bit of kelp and silica. That's my combination that I like to use. Um, and I typically try to do two to three applications from day one to day 10 of flower. Sometimes I'll go past day 10 if I'm running a strain like GMO or a, a strain that usually goes 70 days that is, doesn't have as many pistol formations at day 14. But as soon as I see pistol formations, I'm done spraying. So. Do you pH that solution? When <laughs> I you're... do not pH. Now that's another debate. Whatever works for you. Whatever works for you. There's a lot of, there's, there's no right way to do any of this. This is just how I do things, my experience over the years. I know a lot of guys that do pH, you know, Nectar of the Gods right on here will tell you to pH to 6.2. Uh, I don't, I never have with, with food. 
Um, my my IPM sprays though, if I do stick a meter in them, because I have, they're always around 5.6 to 6 when I'm done adding everything. Um, unless I'm using a ton of silica for the monosilicic, which will down my pH. Um, but still, I, I found no ill effects. Um, I want to be somewhere around, you know, 5.5 to 6, which I typically am. So. Um, so with us, we've been, we do IPM once a week and mm -hmm. we foliar feed once a week as well. You think we should back that up a little? I mean, I mean it, 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 it depends on, again, man, there's no there's no right or wrong way to do this. If I wasn't using beneficial insects and I was feeling pressure, I'd be spraying twice a week. You know, and there was points in my life where I was spraying three times a week because I had rooms that were being maintained by other people and I had constant thrift issues and constant freaking pressure from gnats. And, you know, I mean, and I, I personally have always been, you know, I started in organic no-till. That's where my, like, that's where I started fox farm soil and then i got into organics for a lot of years and i'm huge into beneficials and a lot of people aren't for a lot of reasons i personally just you know i've got something down that i've tailored to how i how my rooms are and kind of the pressure i'm seeing and um you know so i use a combination of them both but if i wasn't using beneficial insects i would be spraying more and, and we are using them but what we what we noticed and we've done some testing ourselves is like the swirskis you know those at 130 ipm they got Swirsky out. Yep. Um, at 80, it didn't bother the Swirskis, nor did it bother thrips when we had seen thrips. That's yep. We had done microscope, sprayed them. At 80, a few minutes, they walk away. 130, wipe it out. So would would you would it be okay if we're running Swirskis to still? Do I, the guess my, I guess my question would be, are you seeing the pressure? Are you seeing constant pressure that 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 makes you have to spray once a week? No. Then I wouldn't. You know that that, but I, again, I don't want I don't want to say don't do that, and no, then all no, of a sudden you're like, bro, I got rushes. Yeah, no, no, I respect that. <laughs> mm -hmm. respect but it's that. it's whatever it's whatever you're seeing. It was right? we had seen some thrips a while back and done some research with it, done our own, you know, are a killer for sure. Yeah, no, and uh, but we you know we we you know one thirty to kill the thrips, but you're wiping out your Swarovskis, and mm -hmm. so once we took care of the problem, we kind of went back to like 70, 75 on the IPM. And it seems, you know, the sports, you still seem to be doing their job. Yeah, I do 75. That's my mills per gallon on the, at the IPM. I mean, I've gone as heavy as 150. And, like, you know, they they, uh, they they took it, you know, no problem. But I don't like spraying that much. I just, I, I like spray. I spray, but I spray as least amount as I have to. I'm talking about IPM. Right, you know, right. If I'm maintaining my environment, it's proper. Everything in that room is proper. I have good SOPs about... You know sanitation and foot traffic and you know and all that stuff i shouldn't need to be doing that all the time you know um but i do spray that's my every two weeks for me but at one point i'm telling you when i'm I, there was one point where i was i got away from using benefit i was spraying three times a week because as soon as i stopped i'd be seeing pressure you know um, i'm a huge proponent of beneficials so, you know that's just me a lot of people don't like it they like poop on my weed and all this other stuff i use beneficials all the way through flower all the, through, all the way through, all the way through. So after I get done spraying at day 10-ish, let's say, then our wait. SOP is we spray, then we skirt, and then we lay, we lay, we lay Swirskis are my go-to. Um, and then for soil born, I'm using row beetles, um, and I'm using uh, the nematodes, you know, const constantly. So I grow in a lot of cocoa, a lot of soil. Um, so for whatever reason, soil and cocoa, gnats are the biggest thing I battle. Right? The ones uh, we buy. What's that? The ones we buy from these yeah. guys. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely not. <laughs> I don't see any right now. Yeah, no, so no, I, do no, of, no, I do a lot of I do a lot of I do a lot of nematode wrenches. Um, for anybody in here that's running sterile, uh, who runs sterile in here? Or even knows what that is? Run sterile? Yeah, like hypochloric acid. Uh, if you're running sterile in your root zone and you're applying nematodes, you want to stop using hypochloric acid the day before and you want to not use it for about two days after that. Nematodes are really just a one-time use. They're gonna, you drench your plant, it's gonna kill everything as it goes through, as far as larva goes. They're gonna, it's gonna eat everything up. But once they make that pass through, they're done for the most part. High levels of hypochlorous acid will lower the motility. Um, so, you know, I usually <laughs> take it off my feed schedule for about a day before. I hand feed my nematodes, top drench down, I'll keep the hypochlorous acid out of the feed for a day or two after, and I'll go right back to my normal feeding. So, when we, we notice when we do nematodes, sticky traps are loaded. Like they just 
Oh yeah. You know they 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 definitely come out of the dirt. Yep. Yeah, yeah. For yeah. sure, it forces them out. If you run, um, if you run uh, another thing, if I'm not going to dive into this too much because we don't have the tools here to talk about it, but I, I follow a very strict ORP schedule. I want to keep my ORP levels in my water above 450. So I use insane amount of hydrochloric acid, and uh, you know if you're staying above 450. It's going to kill your chances of getting any rootborne pathogens are very low, you know, um, and also larva specifically for fungus gnats, they hate it. They just can't. They're still around, but not near as they do not like that highly sterile environment, right? So, so um, you're running a lot higher doses of cleanse. Yeah, I use anywhere from 10 to 25 mils a gallon. Yeah, okay. but, but your water source depicts that as well. I, whatever reason, I mean, everybody's different in their water source. There's even RO starting. Is, is, it's different everywhere with every different aquifer. Um, I know some guys only need nine mils to stay above 450. I need, you know, 10 to 25 uh, mils depending on which place I'm at. So, yep. So, all right, and then uh, mom maintenance. So, some of what we, we just covered with the IPM. Um, moms are probably. My bedroom, I spend more time in my bed than anywhere else. It's the heartbeat of everything. And for years, it was the opposite. It was stressed out plants, who cares, just gotta get them into the flower room. That was my mentality, right? Um, and I know a lot, of, a lot of guys that still are in that same mindset and are slowly starting to see the, you know, where, that, where that has to change. Um, and uh, you know, my moms are like my, now I probably spend more time with my moms. Personally, I do all my own, my own mom work. Nobody touches my mom with me. Um, and I'm, I'm huge on, it all starts with healthy mother stock. You know, I've seen the effects of unhealthy mother stock in my own gardens and a lot of places I've visited. Um, taking stressed out cuts off of stressed out moms is just gonna lead to us terrible starts. Um, and uh, so mom maintenance for me, I'm gonna veg, usually in a one gallon, and then right from a one gallon, as soon as a plant typically has to try, it needs to be water hand fed more than once a day, I, I I'll pot it. You know, as soon as I have to start hand watering something more than once a day and it's drying back to wilt and needs to be potted, again, that's just how I do things. Um, all my moms are hand fed. I don't drip irrigate any of my moms. Um, so I'm gonna go from a, you know, usually a solo cup if I'm in cocoa to a one gallon and then in, into a five, seven or 10 gallon depending on the, the size that I need that mom to get. Um, and I, I like to go from a one, as soon as it needs to be irrigated more than once a day or hand fed, drying back, I put it into a five, seven or 10. And, um, and from there we go. Uh, I, I want my moms wide and healthy. If you keep moms, and my experience on like drip irrigation, who in here runs their moms on drip? Anybody? If I'm in too small of a pot, I can get huge moms in a two gallon, like huge. But the, the wider your plant base, the wider your the root mat, the plant's gonna follow your root mass. If your root mass is huge and wide and healthy, your mom is gonna be huge and wide and healthy. It's really hard when you put a mom in a pot this size and grow a tree and irrigate it 30 times a day, they wanna grow straight up like a rocket. You know what I mean? You end up with nine foot moms, a little unmanageable. It's hard to get them nice and bushed out. That plant naturally wants to go straight up. And, and um, we're, we're, we're flipping through moms because we got a smaller mom room, yep. so we're not keeping them as long, you know, two bronze and out. Yep. Yeah, I, I, I did that same. I have some spots where we still have smaller mom. My big mom spot, I want them in, in bigger pots. And then when I up pot them, I'm going to slowly start pressing those branches out. I don't like the bender snap. I just come in every day and just push them down naturally. Um, light, so par levels for my mom. My moms are going to range from 400 to about 550. Um, that's on an 18.6 light schedule. Uh, every genetic, as you guys probably know, is different. Some of them hate light, some of them love light, some of them hate feed, some of them love feed. Um, 18.6 light schedule, uh, and um, that, that's pretty much it. Let them go. I spend a lot of time pruning up my moms. Um, I want to keep the undercarriage nice and clean and healthy. Uh, two weeks, well, I shouldn't say two weeks, 10 to 14 days before I'm ready to take cuts, like for a big session of cuts, needing like, you know, 50 to 100 good clones off a of mom. I'm going to top that mom down, give it a nice pruning session. Then about seven days before, I'm going to give it a nice foliar feed of food, get those sugars in the, you know, in that plant really running so I can come in and get a nice healthy set of cuts off that mom. I usually take my mom's three to four rounds, a good healthy mom, and, and then she's done. She's retired.
Um, what I see with light stress is I'll see a plant go from you know nice and soft and rigid to I guess hiding from the light, wanting to curl down. Yep. Kind of, that's what you do. Yeah, yeah. So like the clawing, yeah. curling, mm -hmm. is the light stress for sure. Pretty common to see. And you know, if, if I ever have one mom yeah, that's just it, that's that's grow, that's stretchy and grows, you know, I'm usually having to top that mom a lot more, and especially if it hates light. I got to keep it even with everything else. Okay. And definitely can get tricky. In my yeah. early career, that light stress was just through me circles, thinking it was pH or AC, and then finally like oh, yeah. light stress. Yeah, I mean, I run Athena Blended in my mom room, so liquid nutrients for me over the years, I don't push a lot of runoff. I mean, they're very bioavailable to the plant. Um, I usually run, run, run I hand water a very slight runoff once a day. I switch you know. blended in my veg. Yep, uh, ran GH for years, same thing. You know, I mean, uh, very slight runoff with the moms, uh, usually very, very healthy. Once in a while, I get a strain that's light sensitive and I try to just I'll top that one down or bend it out even more. I, I want to keep my, my canopy in my mom room about as as I do in flower, you know, to a certain extent. So, how many more nocitrons is it on pro veg versus blended? I think it's uh, two. two. I think it's six on blended, four on pro. I think you need uh, two more M's and three thousands for blended. So, can we talk about the new blended line real quick? The new, or the, the new blended outer, the or balance pro. Balance power, I mean. Yeah, uh, balance pro is just potassium carbonate, um, so it's not bicarbonate; it's carbonate. Um, we came out with balance pro to not replace, but to offer a pH up that was very. When you get into high injection systems and Netaflex systems and big irrigation systems, you know potassium hydroxate, which is ninety percent of pH up, and is it does not mix well, it cannot mix well with, with a lot of water soluble powders, not just Athena, any of them. High ECs and potassium hydroxate can lead to a lot of fallout. I've seen it with Advance, with General Hydroponics, not just in my own gardens, but gardens across the, the state that I that I visited. And so we our balance, our regular balance is potassium silicate. Silica is really good for your plants, but not at high levels. And I don't personally like to feed it past day 20 to 30 a flower don't like silica in my flower. It's just like nitrogen. It's going to lead to a harsher smoke. It burns just darker. It's just, Is you it know, going to reduce the amount of balance we're going to have to use? Regular with, balance? With our, yeah, with regular yeah, yeah, balance. Yeah, for sure, we're for sure. like 9 to 11. We're almost maxed out. Yeah, so I'm, I'm pro-line, you'll run a lot. <laughs> to run a 3 EC, 6 pH, you'll need about, most water, water sources vary anywhere from 7 to 11 mils is what I've seen. I don't personally like to use more than 4 to 5 mils of balance. I use balance, regular balance only in veg, and I'm at about two mils a gallon to get my EC where I want it, because I'm, uh, I'm using a much lower EC with the blended, only feeding about two EC in veg. The higher EC you go, the more pH off or balance or anything you're gonna need, right, to, to raise that pH up to where you want it. So, so you're, you're running lower EC, you're not pushing like... I, in flower, my pro line, I'm pushing three to three five. Yeah, yeah, for the first three weeks for sure. But in veg, is everything's on blended. I'm only at, I'm only at two EC. That's all I need. Um, liquid liquid nutrients are always going to be ran to much lower EC than, than powders. They're just much more bioavailable. You know, um, powders are being shoved through the cell wall of the plant um, as to where liquids are going to be uptaken more naturally than chelated. So, um, but back back to um, back to the Balance Pro. So the Balance Pro was really designed by. Myself and, and uh, a few other facility advisors that were seeing the same things. High levels of balance. And then I, what I've done for as long as I ran Athena is when I got to stretch, I just flipped over to regular pH up, advanced, general hydro, and I always have to cut it with water because it was too strong to go through my dosatrons because at one mil it was just way too much. So I was cutting it with water, having fallout issues, start talking with a lot of other people that were having fallout issues as well. So we started game planning and coming up with another easy, cheaper solution and potassium carbonate is the best thing to use super clean it's water soluble and it's you're going to get so much bang for your buck compared to uh, you know bottled ph ups right. um, we're it, it, that. we tested it for over a year at multi, uh, not only in our own gardens but with the jungle boys a little bit more at scale mainstream a few other few other large scale operators we did a lot of testing behind it because we wanted to make sure it wasn't going to cause cause issues specifically in injection systems um, you know we're using injection pumps peristaltic pumps things like that um, even even silica over time balance was leading to over time 
clogging up injectors because that's just the nature of silica. <coughs> so, yeah, Balance Pro has just started shipping. Um, should be in most stores in the next couple weeks. Um, definitely, uh, the nice thing is too, is you can mix it to whatever strength you need. If you want a lower strength, you go through your Dostron, mix it to lower strength. If you're still hand batching and you want to you want a higher strength because you don't want to put as much in, you can, you can mix it to a higher strength. Um, so let's, let's, I guess let's switch and start talking about like the, uh, EC stacking. We'll, we'll kind of cover a lot of these. Uh, who here grows in soil, like regular soil? Anybody, any soil growers? Soil. Cocoa? Cocoa perlite. Cocoa perlite. And then Rockwell? One Rockwell guy? All right. Um, so is that, is everyone in here, who, is anyone here growing organic? Organic growers? Okay, cool. Um, probably not going to apply as much, this, this section, for the organic guys. Um, you know, organics are a completely different ball game. I love organic growing, and, and the organic gardeners are the real growers. Soil growing is easy. Organic growing is not. Um, and uh, you got to be about, what, two weeks ahead at all times when you're, when you're in organics, with how your plants are responding. So this is more going to be uh, tailored to guys growing with salts and inert medias. Um, cocoa, rock wool, um, and typically, uh, who here is, what, what pot size are you guys running? Ones, twos, tens, fives, threes, how many plants per light? How many? Eight plants per light in threes? Okay. What's that? Twelve. Who said that? Back, twelves, what, what size? No, no, no. Twelve plants. 12 plants per light, and what size media? Threes? Uh, and uh, are you guys, who in here is hand watering? And who here is not like drip or open flow? Okay. So typically, I guess we'll start with, we put out a good SOP with Athena. Uh, I want to say it was, I want to say a month or so ago, we talked a lot about plant. Plant sizing to media size. I think that's something that we need to talk about. It's not talked about enough. So I run a lot of spots at nine plants per four by four or five by five area. It seems to be a sweet spot for me. I've done the 16, I've done the 12, um, and I, I feel like nine plants is, is for me, the plants are able to really laterally branch out nice. They don't get as congested in the canopy. My yields seem to be the best on par there in the quality of flower. Um, and when I'm running nine plants per or uh, four by four, let's just say. What size, what size pot? That's what we're gonna talk about. So I, I run in either a one gallon, nothing bigger than a one gallon. You see that, you got a question, bud? Yeah, so could you run me through, I guess, what um, your early stages of bed are looking like uh, if you're building up like this uh, dry backs? So let's say like you have a clone and you're planting it into a pot, uh, you're watering it to run off the first day. Okay, are you not watering it until it dries back? Or are you giving it a couple days in order to like build a little bit of roots, like what's that? What's that look like? For you? Yeah, let's let's talk about. It. It's a good, it's a good point, buddy. Yeah, I'm, I'm talking about that, build up that. Um, so if you're if you are going to run off, like, letting it dry back, are you also promoting less biomass, or like can you, do I want more biomass if I let it dry dry back? Or yeah, so so we want thing? we want dry back during stretch because we want to produce sex sites. We want to stress when you dry back, you stress. Like in veg, like early veg. Early veg, so we'll, in, in veg, yeah. I want to cue my plant just like I do in bulk. In veg, I don't want my plant to stress. Mm. When, I, when I'm building a teen up, when I'm watering my moms, I don't let my moms dry back to bone dry. And I don't want to stress those plants. But let's let's talk about what he says because I think it'll make a, what he asked, I think it'll make more sense. So I'll, I'll just, I'll talk about what I do and hopefully it can, you know, correlate across the board. I'm usually vegging in a, a cube or a, a Grodan Rockwell cube or you know, a peat, peat rooter. When I get that clone, I'm typically going into a Delta block in Rockwell. That's what I do. I veg my teams in Rockwell and then I bring them in into Cocoa. So, but the same thing applies if you were going right in for, with that rooted clone and do one gallon. The same thing would apply. Um, so I'm going to soak that Delta block. I'm going to take that fleshy rooted clone. I'm going to literally dunk that block in my veg solution. I am not, you never wring cocoa out. That's, a, some people may, may be thinking, why would you ever do that? Trust me, people do that. Do not wring cocoa or rock wool out. You saturate 100%, set that thing down completely 100% saturated at field capacity, stick that clone, and I set it over in the corner, and 
I can tell you that a good rooted cologne, it'll be three to four days till I need to touch it. I let that thing dry back, 50%. Same, same thing I want to see during early flower. And what you'll usually see in that block is that about day three or four, you'll pick it up and it'll feel, well, 50% of what it was, and you'll see roots popping out the bottom. Now at that time, I'm going to give it one more top feed. 100% top feed, I'm going to completely saturate that cube again. This time, it'll probably only take two or three days, complete 50% dry back again. Now those roots are going to be blowing out that bottom. It should be growing nice by now. Now, I'm going to either plug it to my drippers, and I'm going to start my vegetative dripping cycle to get that thing to grow, which for me is typically only seven days. So I'm going to, I'm going to plug it to drippers, and now I only want that thing drying back during veg for me, 25%. That's all I want during veg. I want half of what I want during early flower. So what that means is that if I'm hitting 50% at my field capacity, the next day I only want to, I only want to dry back 25% of that 50%, which is, what is that, 12 and a half? Say I want to dry back like 12 and a half, down to probably like 37, 38%. I want to keep that plant much more, I don't want to stress it. And then when I bring it in and I set it on my one gallons to what, again, what he just asked, when I, when I transplant that again, same thing applies. I'm gonna saturate my slab or my pot and I'm gonna plant that and I'm gonna let it be until it dries back 50% and I'm gonna follow that same program to get that plant to bust into its new pot. So common mistakes I see are transplant or overwatering. Just keep fucking watering, watering a new clone and then just it's wet feet and dies. Yup, too dry. I mean, so cocoa, Cocoa, we want to buffer always, right? A lot of people have different methods to buffering. Whatever works for you, keep doing it. For me, I am I try to keep things as military as I can, and I try to have as least amount of recipes as possible. I use my veg, my 2.0, 5.8 solution of blended for everything. Clone soaking, rock wool soaking, um, transplanting for everything, and for charging my cocoa. So if I have a fresh pot of cocoa, I'm going to charge it, which means just drench the shit out of it, like run out the bottom. I want, when we transplant into our flower room, we each zone, we, we fill hard pots or we use cocoa bags. We're going to we're gonna soak every single one and we're catching our runoff and we're watching our runoff for that zone on that table. And I want to see the same thing coming out or damn near close that I'm putting in. That way, that now I know that my cocoa is, is charged. Uh, Floriflex for years had issues with hot cocoa, high metals. Um, you'll get batches of cocoa from time to time that are just, they're hot, and you'll burn the shit out. You want to make sure that your runoff coming out of that cocoa is what we, what we say by charging it. Make sure that what's coming out is damn near what you're putting in. So, 100%. And then when you transfer that plant, you shouldn't need to touch it, even if you're going straight into a pot. If you're taking a nice root of clone and going to a charged pot of cocoa, and you're burying it, you should not have to touch that plant for like a week. And what, if I go clone into one of these, which I used to, seven days i won't have to touch that thing it'll take that long for that thing to dry back and the roots to start to you know bust out into that media how long do you charge it for uh just the initial soak initial charge 30 minutes or um we just we just hand water to run off and we're monitoring that runoff to make sure that zone is close to what we're putting in sometimes i gotta run a lot of water like in a, in a one or two gallon pot i'll have to run five gallons through it just because a lot sometimes we'll get hot cocoa lately last year it's been pretty good um, you know, I use a lot of, uh, I use the uh, Bio 365, I use charcoal, I'm kind of cheap, just whatever's on sale, rip bags, you know, whatever's good. Yeah. Uh, but just, just watching that so run. you're not soaking it, you're like putting it through the top? Hey, top feeding, hand water, sure. hand water. Okay. Soaking it, charging it. Okay, each pot. Yeah, so I go through and hit each one. If I'm using... Yeah, I don't to be soaking before I put my club in there. Yep. <laughs> Yeah, we're soaking. We're not. We're not. We're not watering that clone in. We're going through this before we even clone yeah. in. We're charging every pot. No, I thought you were like pot. pouring into like a big storage container and no. putting a bunch of water in. I think no. he's talking so, about the rock wool cubes. Yeah. What's that? He's talking no. about the. the I'm talking about the cocoa. Both of them. The oh, process is the oh. same for both of these. This one I'm going to dunk into a solution, completely submerge. You know, in my in this solution right here. Mm. And typically, when I'm charging rock wool, the only difference is. I'm going to drop this pH to about 5.5. Rock wool is naturally going to be a little bit more, it's, it's going to want to throw higher pH out the bottom. 
okay? So I'm gonna tip my pH down just a little bit. We're gonna soak this thing 100%, literally dunk it into a barrel, set it on the table, plug my cologne next. With cocoa, I'm gonna set my whole table up with these pots, and if it's loose fill, I'm filling every one up, and I'm coming behind and I'm hand feeding every single one, and I'm monitoring the runoff of that zone to make sure that I'm getting about what I'm feeding coming out the bottom of the runoff. If I'm using bags, I'm using drippers to do my initial moistening, right? And then I'm still going through, because with bags is where I'll usually see the pre-bagged the pre -bagged, um, quick fills is where I'll usually see a little bit higher EC within the cocoa. And I still, whatever I have to do to, to get the same thing coming out that I'm putting in. Is that what Athena product uses? What's that? Is that yeah, what the Athena product uses? Yeah, yeah. So whatever room I'm using, if I'm using, um, if I'm using Athena, you typically all, everything I do in veg is all going to be Athena. If I'm going into flour, I'm going to usually soak with that same EC, the initial soaking, when I transplant. And then when I start feeding, obviously, in flour, I'm going to switch over to whatever nutrient I'm using for that room. So, try to keep the recipes the same. I use one veg recipe for almost everything. Do you ever have, have you ever had an issue with a magnesium problem with you and Magnesium? Yeah. Uh, Proline or blended? Proline, no. Um, typically, if you're seeing, so the beautiful thing about the Proline specifically is that it's two part. So, so during during veg, if you ever see a magnesium magnesium deficiency, typically it's going to be a late veg or early flower. Is that when you're seeing it? So you're going to want to. I usually just up my core. So that's a two part system, and you can take your ratios wherever you want with that. that that's the beauty. That's what I love about that line. You know, later flower, I'm dropping that core out. I don't want nitrogen laden flower. I'm pushing the bloom, I'm pushing the phosphates, and I'm taking the core, the calonite, and the mag and I'm taking all that stuff down. So if, I, if you're seeing that, I would bump your EC a little bit, and I would bump the percentage of core that you're using, probably 50-50. Bump that core up a little bit. So when you say you're taking it away, are you going 70-30, 80-20? Yeah, yeah, so um, typically, typically after stretch, I'm going to 70-30. Okay. Um, I'm keeping my EC about the same. But I'm, again, I'm just, I'm starting to push more bloom and I'm dropping out that, that cow night. And then when I get to like day 49, like I'm at day 49 in a room today, and I go from feeding 3.0, 70.30, and I just tank it right off, and I'm at 1.5 EC, 90.10. So I'm hardly keeping any, cal any, any, just enough calcium in there to give my plants calcium, and I'm pushing 90% sulfates. Day 49, 90. I cut everything in half. Yeah. 63 day schedule. If I was going to 70 plus, I'd probably take that, extend that another 54 week. Or 56, 54. Yep. So, um, biggest thing with transplanting is your dry bags. I mean, you gotta got just not over water. I think all of us, including myself, I've got wet feet on plants so many times where you go to transplant them, you hit them too hard with water a couple times, and they really haven't got those roots to start expanding yet, and they just drown out. But as long as the roots there, they're gonna suck up and they just wanna. Not they're sitting in water. If it's too wet, you, you know, you're, you're, if you continue to hit them with water before those plant, those roots have had a chance to start getting out into that media, we'll get what they call wet feet and they'll just, just get drowned essentially. They don't really got to search for water, they're just there. Well, they drowned it, you know, when you keep top feeding them. So, same thing goes for transplant. When I transplant my moms from a two or a one into a five or seven or a 10, I'm going to transplant that. I'm going to charge in the media first in cocoa, transplanting that, and then giving it a big water in for bombs. And I'm going to let that thing sit. I won't have to touch it for probably four or five days. I just let that thing expand out into the media until you see some dry cocoa on top and it's starting to dry back. So back to, back to uh, what we were talking about with the kind of swell EC stacking tapering down. Um, so we kind of got into flour, but we're looking back for dry backs. As far as EC, you know, I'm a proponent of check. I check my runoff at every spot, every table, every zone, at least every other day, if not every day. I want to know what my runoff's coming out at. Substrate sensors are awesome, but my runoff for me is my real teller of what's going on. Um, and I want to see... Are you just collecting it? Yeah, all my rows have like a have like a tote underneath of them that are all piped together. Where I can ball valve that tote off, collect all that water. Yeah, I'm taking it now. If I have a if I have a slow drinker or 
you know, a heavy feeder or a plant that looks, then I will raise that one single pot up and start measuring that one plant. Like what's going on? Does it need an extra dripper? Does it need a flush real quick? What does it need? Does it need a pot reset? But typically if, if all things are going well, I'm, I'm collecting from that zone. So typically during stretch, I'm going to want to maintain like a 4.5 to somewhere around an ADC in my runoff. Okay. Now, now again, this is running, this is running Cocoa, Rockwell, you know, um, in, in, in I, I've established my drybacks. Okay. This is what I'm going to want to see in my runoff. And I'm going to want to be hitting those 50% fuel capacity. I mean, 50% drybacks from fuel capacity. Now, when we get into bulk and swell, now I'm going to change to about a 25% dryback instead of a 50. Okay, now for me, my bulking period starts usually about day 25 to 30. I usually, we strip down our plants. Usually after you strip plants, they don't drink. You do a lot of damage to plants, they don't drink for a few days. So we'll let them sit for the same feeding schedule and then we'll get into bulk. And when we get into bulk, we don't want to stress our flowers anymore. Now we want to say, oh, okay plant, you stacked for us. We've stretched you during, we've stressed you during stretch. Now we're going to keep you nice and calm and let you put on weight, right? And that's what we all want. So um, I'm going to continue to feed the same, but I'm going to push more runoff because I want my runoff, my core EC to come down. Now the plants, the plant is going to be the hungriest during stretch. That plant wants calcium, magnesium. I mean, it's just screaming for everything. It's growing, it's tripling in size. That's why we want that higher core EC. When we get into bulk, we want to lower that, and I'm going to be looking for usually a, you know, a 3.5 to a 5 EC, assuming I'm running a 3 EC pro line, let's say, okay? I'm going to want to see, I'm going to, in, how do I get that lower core EC? Push more runoff, right? High ECs occur because of what within the media? Anybody yeah, know? Yeah, right. Right. yeah, salt buildup from drying back, right? When you dry back to that 50%, what's left after all the water's gone? Salt, right? That's where we get these huge EC numbers. And when you start to irrigate it, your P1 is pushing all those salts out, and that's where you're seeing a higher higher EC. If you're keeping a plant too moist, and you were to push the, the runoff on that, I promise you it'll be super low. It'll be lower, what, right? What do you want your runoff on a uh, uh, stretch and walk to be? My runoff EC? No, just like runoff the volume of water. Uh, volume know? of water, I mean, during, during stretch, I'm usually at about 10%. You know, during bulk, I'm anywhere from 25 to 35, depending on what I'm seeing and where my EC levels are. You know, I mean, I could push a lot. If I, if I have hungry feeders that are, that are, you know, really, really hungry, I push a lot of runoff during bulk to keep that EC down, you know, up to 30%. And then, and like, my buddy Max and I have a joke, like, during stretch sometimes, his runoff collection is a solo cup. Literally, it'll feel, feel you know, I mean, it's barely anything sometimes because those plants need that higher EC. When things from your VPD, and this ties into VPD and transpiration rates and all that other stuff within the room as well. We're assuming everything's perfect here within the room. Um, so when we get into bulk, we're going to keep that, we're going to lower that EC by more runoff, and that more runoff comes during P1. So let's say I was scheduling one, two, three, four, five, let's say. We're going six shots to get the field capacity during P1 during stretch. Okay, let's say these were minute and a half shots, and I was only pushing 10% runoff, and everything was good, right? So what I'm going to do is when I get into swell, I'm not going to change the number of shots. I'm just going to up the duration of the shot. So now, if I if I was at one and a half minutes, I'm going to change it to two and a half minutes. That's going to ensure that I start pushing more runoff, and I'll start measuring that runoff. And, and I'll make adjustments based on what I'm seeing in that in, in the EC numbers, right? So when I when I change that from two and a half to one and a half, I'm pushing that many more mills out the bottom, which is flushing more salts out, bringing down my core EC. Now I'm still pushing the same three EC. Now it, the only time I'll change, make corrections to this EC for me, is if I'm having too much trouble. If I have a major spike in my EC, or these things, I just can't get those numbers down then I will, I will start tapering down my EC. I start seeing burning tips. If I have a finicky feeder, I will take down my EC a little bit to correlate from that. But typically I keep my feed the same. I just push more runoff during P1, okay? Now, so we, we pushed more runoff here, right? So now we pushed a lot more runoff. Same time period, first two hours. Nothing changes other than the duration of the shot. We're gonna push more runoff. 
and then we're going to maintain that field capacity because now we don't want a 50% dry back anymore. We want to dry back only 25%. So we need to start giving maintenance shots during the afternoon, however many we need, to maintain only a 25% dry back until the next day down here again, right? And so typically when I get into swell, it may take me two, three, four, five days to establish what does that maintenance shot cycle look like. I may set it for once an hour for you know two and a half minutes. Typically, I will set my maintenance shots every hour on the hour all afternoon uh, with the same duration as my, my P1 shots are. So if this is two and a half minutes, I'm gonna take a two and a half minute shot every hour on the hour all afternoon up until an hour before lights off. That's, that, that's my number one that I'll go to right away when I get into bulk. And then I will kind of make adjustments based off of what I'm seeing after a couple days. Is it too much? Am I, am, I, am I not drying back enough? Am I only drying back 10%? Am I keeping them too wet? Then I may back off the duration, or I may just take a couple shots off in the afternoon to hit that dry back. Then the shots day. are basically just, uh, you want to um, stagger them to the point where you're not seeing any dripping. Basically, where I'm not seeing that's that. the goal. Now, you may once in a while see a little bit, but typically, I'm going to want to see in between each one of these shots. I'm looking for three to five percent dry back down and then back up, down and then back up, down and then back up. Now, there's no one way to just set all this. And you know, Rolling tried to do this with a irrigation controller, and you can't like you, you have got to be in your garden, you've got to be reading this to your best of your ability. You now, some of my best runs I've had today when I was irrigating six hours into the night, every hour, because my dry bags, because I was growing huge plants in small pots. Those plants, man, when, you, when you're able to steer them and drive that car and give them whatever you want, manipulate everything, it's, it's a beautiful thing. You could finish plants earlier. I mean, I never have to take plants to 70 days anymore. I can just stress them at the end through generative cues of drying back to get them to finish. I mean, it's a beautiful thing when you really get into no irrigation strategy. You can cue that plant to do whatever. So you're saying that at the end of the cycle, if you got one that's taken 10 weeks, you can just manipulate it by stressing it out? Yep, sure. you, can, you can shorten the life for sure on that plant, stress it out. Um, we'll talk about that next, because pretty much you're gonna go to this bulk period for anywhere from say day 25 to 30. For me, it ends at about day 49, and that's on a typical 63 day cycle. I don't take too many rooms past 63 days anymore unless I have to. Um, sometimes with a new genetic, I don't know how it, what it likes to do, I'll just let it keep going and then next time I'm like, all right, I got you, I'm stressing you harder at the end, we ain't going 75 days ever again. You know, but typically, day 25 to day 49 is gonna be this bulk period, okay? And I make adjustments on the fly to my irrigation strategy per what I'm seeing on my graphs. So what I look at every morning I get up, I take a shit, I grab my coffee, and I fucking look at my phone, I look at all my graphs. Where am I at? Where were the plants at yesterday? How were they drinking? And then I'm getting runoff numbers, you know, either myself or from, you know, some of my friends at some of the spots. We're collecting runoff data and, and then we make changes to this based on what we're seeing. After we get through bulk, so for me it's day 49, we're gonna go back to what we were doing at the beginning of flower, okay? We're going back to stressing those plants. So we've stressed them at the beginning to produce flower sites. We, we gave them a lot of rest and relaxation. We sent them down to Florida for a couple weeks here. We let them lay on the beach and just swell and get fat. And now we're gonna start stressing them for the last two or three weeks to get a few things. I want the flowers to finish. I will never chop. And the worst thing you can ever do is chop room early. God, don't chop room early. If a flower is not done, you gotta let it finish. Worst thing you can do in today's market is to chop flower early. Um, and what I mean by chop flower early is I want that calyx is right and I want the pistils turned. I want that thing faded and done, right? Um, so at day 49, we're gonna stress them and we're gonna look for flower maturation. We want that flower to mature. And this is when trichome development has already started to happen during bulk, but it really happened the last two weeks in terpene, right? Like, you know, I mean, the last few weeks is when I'll walk into a room and just be like, holy shit, like, here we go. You know what I mean? Like the, the smells are coming out. Um, we're gonna start tapering feed down, which is what we're gonna talk about. And that last two to three weeks is where we, we essentially bury that plant. We're preparing that plant to die, right? So that plant naturally is gonna wanna start to die. And if we don't, if we do certain things wrong here, whether in our feed, in our environment, or in our irrigation strategy, we're going to promote growth, which is not what we wanna do now. That plant's already grown, it's already swelled, and now we wanna slowly bury it and lay it, lay it to rest, right? So for me, day 49, 
my feed gets cut in half. So if I'm feeding 3 EC, I'm going to 1.5. And I'm also going down to very minimal, either CalMag if you're running liquid, or very minimal um, core if you're running a, a Proline, or if you're running any kind of powder, your Cal Nitrate, you want it to get tapered down to about 10%. So I'm gonna run 90% bloom for me, and I'm gonna run 10% core for the pro line. That's for me, that's how I do it, right? And, and that's I, day 49. This is day 49. I literally just go, okay, we've given them everything. By day 49, your swell is done. Now, if you're running GMO or you're running something you know needs to go 75 days, you're gonna extend this out. You wanna leave the last, you know, I would say comfortably, you're gonna wanna leave the last two to three weeks to, to finish that plant out. For me, I can do it in two. Sometimes I'll even start this a little earlier though. I have some strains that just, I know they take a little bit more while to mature, so I'm gonna start stressing them a little bit earlier. So I'm gonna go, I'm gonna cut my, but what happens when I cut my feed? What are, what are other, some other things that have to happen that will degrade flower at the end of flower, at the end of flower if you don't? Light intensity. Light intensity, that's one. Yeah, that's what I was gonna say. Yeah, light intensity, what else? CO2. CO2. Yeah. What's that? Temperature. Temperature, humidity. humidity, temperature, CO2, lighting, huge. So I don't know if you guys, everybody's been cultivating for different periods of time, but the last four or five years we've seen this trend of like, since you know salts have been more prominent in our industry, you know the salts. There was this common term that like salts lack terps, right? Um, I've heard a lot, and I kind of laugh because I've I've been growing salts for longer than five years, a long time, a long time, and. Um, one of the things, I, you know, I, I this is an opinion of mine, it's not facts, just, you know, I, I put a lot of things together, I've talked to a lot of people, see a lot of things, and, you know, it all started when LEDs came out. And I, you know, started doing a lot more consulting the last five years, home growers, commercial growers, you know, um, and I don't see a lot of people, there's so many people that just run these LEDs to the absolute 100% to the day they chop, and there's nothing worse you can do then the last three weeks, just give your plants fucking 1,500 you more. That is the, you're promoting growth. The last two weeks, we do not want to promote growth anymore. High light intensity promotes growth. CO2 promotes growth. And, and high feed promotes growth, right? So we want to take those things away from the plant. You got to think about nature. What happens in September, October, right? The light is not as intense. We're having less light during the day. Temperatures are starting to drop off. You know, all these things. And so... You know, I, I personally think that LEDs have got a lot to do with why we, we see so much degraded flower on the market. It's just that, my personal opinion. But that's with that's with observation, though, right? If your if your flowers look like it's not finished at that time, you still can go. Well, what what but, but I don't want to see finished flower at day forty nine. I'm not there yet. I want to see swelling, right? I want to see that that plant. And again, with new genetics, I'll slip up because I don't know what to expect, right? Genetics, I ran over and over. I know when that flower's done swelling, you know, and and. For me, at day 49, I'm stopping regardless because I want quality flour. I don't want, I'm not a weight guy. I don't care if I get five pounds of lighter. If I get two, I want fire. You know what I mean? And the way that I personally get that is, is by stopping all this intense shit at about day 49. Um, I want to cut my light. I cut my light in half. Everything gets cut in half. So if I'm feeding about 1,000 to 1,100 with LEDs, at day 49, I'm going to like five, 600. Feeds get cut in half, lights get cut in half, CO2 gets shut off, everything. You know, we're done. We're done letting that plant lay on the beach. Now we're going to start stressing it again. And that's going to bring out the color. That's going to help start to, to, to really finish that flower off. They're going to harden up a lot at the end. Um, so you see, the same thing with HPS? That's, the HPS is very much the same thing. Yep. I'm, I'm cutting everything down. Everything is cut down at day 49. You know, we, we've seen... We've seen everything we need to see by that point. If you continue to run high numbers of CO2, high numbers of light, high numbers of feed, you're going to see irregular growth, foxtailing, diminished terpenes. I mean, you know, if you're not taking your, your temperature, which we haven't talked about yet, over 80 degrees, those terpenes, they're just going to start frying everything off, especially with high light levels. You know, um, you know some of the best flower I've seen quality-wise is always growing under the lowest light. Why? Because that, that plant's not it's not being stressed, you know, it's not being stressed hard during it's not being stressed hard its whole life and usually just stressed hard a little bit at the end by drying back, right? So high light levels, high CO2, gotta cut those out. Day 49.
in my opinion. Um, again, if you're running a GMO or some other strain, I would take that to probably get three. Turn your CO2 off to 49 or just back? Off. I turn it ambient. Mine gets cut off. I don't I don't need I don't need it anymore at that point. So now again, you know, this is just my experience over the years. I'm not saying this is there's one way to do it, this is just how I do it. Um, I know people that run their CO2 later in the flower. I get it. I get most of my, my stacking and bulking done at day 49. I don't need that CO2 anymore for me. So um, I'm still going to maintain usually 300 ambient in my rooms, you know, two to 300 ambient CO2. So everything gets cut off. And then the other thing we're going to start doing is we're going to go back to drying back at 50%. So I'm going to water my pots heavy, feed them heavy, whether you're hand feeding. I'm going to go back to this P1 is still going to get kept the same. So I'm going to push a lot of runoff but those P2s are gonna get taken out. I want that plant to start drying back. It's really stressing. So you and take the P2s out after day 49? I take the P2s out, with an exception. I don't want them dead in the morning. No, so I may right, need right. one or two, but I want to try to shoot back to that control with your P1, in other words. Well, I mean, the P1, I'm gonna control my runoff. Right, right. So I want to start lowering my core EC2, right? right. I mean, we, lo we cut the 1.5 EC. I'm still gonna be pushing a lot of runoff here, but I want that plant to start drying back again and stressing it, just like I was during during the pump early stretch. That's gonna promote, that's gonna help that plant die off. You know, I mean, that's that's uh, that's how I get good fade on my plants, good terpene production on my plants, you know, and um, the, at the end of flower, I usually give them, you know, their last feeding, really, really heavy runoff, and I want them to dry back to almost wilt before the chop. <coughs> so. so, again, I'm not saying this is the only way to do it, but this has just been round after round after round how I see my best results. And most of my friends follow somewhat around, you know, and I, and again, I mess around. I ran CO2 all the way into the flower. I've kept my lights high. I ran three C to chop. I got a lot of room, so we're always trialing stuff. This is where I've seen my best results for finished flower. Have I seen more biomass and more yields running three C to flower and keeping my CO2 cranked up with high light levels? Yes. Yeah, much bigger yields. If you're a yield guy, crank everything. Crank it. You will see degradation quality. So we've hit, um, oh God, man, we, we did one run where we fed like four, four and a half EC. We had light levels of around 12 to 1500 UMO all the way to chop. And we got like over four pounds of light, but the shit was boof. Nerf footballs, you know what I mean? So it, it's really, it really depends on, if you're a hash guy too, man, you'll, you will degrade your hash returns greatly in the flower, especially with intense light levels. I'd say that's the number one killer for me. The last week of flower, my lights are even down even more. I'm usually at like three, 300 par at the canopy the last week. That plant's done. Now we're just, we want it to die. We want it to fade. We want it to ripen up. There's no more bulking or stacking or, you know, we're just preparing that plant to die. Um, <clears throat> I run most of my rooms, 11, 13 light cycle. Um, some rooms I still run 12 and 12. I don't see a lot of difference for me. I just push a little bit more heavier par during the day when I run 11, 11 13, keep my DL, DLI about the same. And then usually the last week, I'm down at about 10 hours of light, 14 hours of darkness, just trying to mimic what's going on outside. So now DLI, that's something that we haven't touched on. Mm -hmm. You know, um, when, you know, you, what are you coming in on your early veg for, for par? I mean, I do more par than I do DLI because I, I just, so many genetics, I just, they're all so different. But typically for my clones, I want to be about 150. Uh, my, my, my teens and freshly rooted clones, I'm at about you know, two to 300, regardless, of, depending on if I'm running 18.6 or 24.7 light. So you're more worried about the DLI going into flower more so than an early veg. Yep, yep. And, and again, I mean, like I, I do a lot more based on, on par level too. I know where my DLI is at at certain par levels, right? And unless you have a laser point canopy in your rooms, your DLI and par levels in that room are all over the place. Your par levels are all over, your DLI is all over the place. Yeah. Yeah. Does anybody have any questions about, you know, tapering down? Um, end of flower, like what, what do you guys, what do you guys see in your own gardens? You know, I mean, where, where do you, what are you seeing in your, in your flower? What are you seeing at the end of flower that you, that you have questions about that you don't like? I mean, what, what, um, you know, I mean, for me, when I push too high a levels, 
I didn't get the end product that I wanted. Period. It didn't smoke right. It didn't smell right. And I don't give a shit what, what, what I was growing with. It didn't matter. You know, for me, I'm I'm after the best flower possible. That's what intrigues me to get up every day. This, right? And then fuck it up right at the end with your care. Product. Yeah, we'll talk about that next, right? You can do everything right and then, right. then botch that and it don't matter. That's, that's, that's what I see with a lot of guys. You know what I mean? I, I've, I've seen so many guys that are like, they're growing on fire and then their end product is always shit. And I'm like, all right, well, let's, let's go do your care process. Everybody always wants to rush it. You know what right. I mean? Especially now in the day of trying to get the tax out as fast as possible, yeah. everybody wants to rush that process. Man, I think that's where you can just kill it. You know? Yeah, it's it's uh, and, and and listen, like, you know, this is this is um this is what I've seen based on on my experience. You know, there's articles I've read things and like, you know, I've there's science that proves certain things and that I I have not seen those same things with my eyes. So I base everything that I. I base all, but I base all this what I experience, you know, not what I read, not what I, not what I, not what somebody's told me. I base it off of, of what I experience. You may experience different things. You may, you know, you may if your flower's selling and it's and you're you're good with the way you're doing it, keep doing what you're doing. I tell everybody all the time, I'm like, I don't make changes fast. I got a lot of friends in the industry and they'll suggest, hey man, you should try this. I'll try it on like one end of a table or you know I'll try something different in a very small room or. I may wean into something, but we're not in a we're not in an industry anymore that you anybody should just be running out and trying to change everything they're doing overnight. Whatever's paying your bills, you need to continue to do. I don't care if it's lighting, nutrients, whatever, whatever, whatever's working for you. If you want to change things, baby steps, one hundred percent, one hundred percent. So, so I guess that leads into post production because, like he just said, you can do all this right have the best round ever and then have a have a dehue malfunction and you know lose everything post production so what are um what are your guys's methods for post production uh, 60 60 for two weeks just uh, cut them and hang them and then i put them in totes for two weeks and then trim them yeah and keep them in there yeah. what's that zap them the first couple days zap them the first couple days Yeah, so so fans on your flower no go. Um, I I have experimented with it, his method back there. Is a lot of commercial guys. That's you know, and, and myself. Some of my rooms, I have a couple dry rooms that I just don't. I have some dry rooms that are very dialed in with HVAC and dehues where I don't need to do that, and they does stay you know right where I want it. But I'm always a little bit lower uh, the first couple days because I would rather be five points lower on my RH than fucking five points over. I don't ever want my humidity higher than my temperature in my dryer, ever. I'd rather have it 60-50 all day. And like he said, your plant, your your HVAC will, it'll get a lot of that water out the first day or two. Even a lot of times, I just do like the first 24 hours. I'll just get all that initial shit out of there and then it stabilizes. Some rooms I can go right in at 60-60 and it'll hold. Typically, I like to be 58. I have some rooms I can get colder than 60. 58 degrees, 60 degrees. And I like somewhere between 53 to 58% humidity. You know, that's my sweet spot. First, first 24, 48 hours, I may take that all the way down and then it may raise back up to this. Some rooms I can hold that right off the bat. Dark, um, you know, you definitely want airflow. I like to, I like a flutter. I wanna see all my leaves. I wanna see leaves just like my room's kind of doing that. But it's the same thing in your rooms. I don't want fans blowing and like causing wind burn. You definitely don't want that in your dry room. Um, dark as can be, um, and then uh, you know we buck and we go after about 14 days. You know we're going into totes. Um, I like to, if, if time allows, with trimmers to burp those totes shucked without being trimmed for about a week. Stir them up, keep them in. That's everything is kept. My flower never leaves this room until it's sold ever, ever leaves that room um, when it's trimmed in those same conditions. My trimmers hate it. They bitch all the time. It's fucking freezing. I don't wear a coat. It works better though. Yeah. You know, What's up, man? 
you ever do uh, bug washing, indoor or outdoor? I have for outdoor, yeah, for sure. H2O2. Yep. If you're bud washing, yeah, definitely, definitely tank it down. We used to, we bud wash all outdoor. We used to, we process for rosin, um, you know, just because of bugs, literally. You know, um, give it a wash. Definitely want to make sure you have the HVAC, HVAC to support that in your dry room. Usually, you know, let them, let them hang dry a little bit before you bring them into the room. Um, but yeah, definitely, definitely been there for sure. So burp, trim, and then, you know, again, this is where everybody's different. I personally, I trim everything. Everything's done in the same room. Only time the lights come out are when, there's, when it's trimmed and then everything goes back in the darkness, everything gets bagged up. And then those bags are usually burps, you know, for about seven to 10 days. And then they're knotted and they're left alone for about two weeks. And that, that's my process. Everybody's is different. I know I've, I, we've all probably been there where people are banging down your door and you don't even have that option. They're like, yo, I want that shit now. You know, we've all been there. So in a perfect scenario, I try to stagger all my rooms so I can follow the same. That's where I feel like I get the best product, you know. So biggest thing post-production is, you know, drying too fast and too high temperatures for sure. What's up? I mean, I don't really want to go above like 65 degrees if I can't help it. But again, you may not have the HVAC to support going this low. And if you don't, I mean, you, you, you know, you got to go to wherever you can to maintain I'd say the humidity is, is, is the most important thing in that dry room at that point. So if you can only, if you have a dehu that doesn't handle colder temperatures that well, um, then you may have to go up to 70 degrees to maintain that, you know, 55% humidity. So. Yeah, I just saw it last night and I had like a 10 by 8 by 6 room. And I have only got to cool with this rolling AC at this point in that room. Um, it's probably like from 2018, like right now it's, it's at 66 in there and 57. Right. So, you know, if the, if the DU's going, heat's coming out of that, and then, if it, you know, it's kind of fighting each other, you know, kind of, it's a 14,000 BPU rolling AC, but I don't know if it's so old that maybe it's gotten worse performance. Right. So, I mean, I just, those numbers, my last driver room 6060 was on point, but this one's kind of struggling to get to that point. So, I'm just trying to get that acceptable level, I guess. Yeah, I would go with a little higher temperature to maintain your, your humidity for sure. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, that's that that's that's pretty much it as far as post-production, but I just had a malfunction in my, I had one of my my dry rooms where they're like, uh, I had a guy switch my DHU onto ex to, to uh, external, um, I'm sorry, manual instead of external, so the DHU just kept running. Just kept running past that two day window. So my, my ships dried in like six days and looks great but it don't smoke the same just don't so like i just went through this again and it's you know gardening is all about you know it's never like a graph where it's just perfect you're gonna have those ups and downs it's just story of my life and story of, story of gardening you know what i mean um you're gonna have mechanical failures you're gonna have employee failures you're gonna have things that happen and it's just about trudging through it you know um i guess like i'd like to talk about uh room sanitizing and uh i'd like to hear what you know, we haven't covered that topic yet. I think it's a, a big, a big thing too. Like, you know, resetting your flower room, kind of like what you guys are doing. Um, you know, what what I've, I can, I'll throw out some things that I've learned over the years, some things I've ran into. Um, and uh, yeah, does anybody, anybody want to walk through kind of what they do when they're resetting the flower room? Dylan, may I interject really quick? If anybody needs a break or have a need a cold water, I have a total of cold water right over here. If you guys need to have a, like a beverage or anything, okay? Please help yourself. Thanks. Thank you. Um, so last night I just chopped, everything's a mess, dirty, you know, the room looks awful. So it's going to be cleaning out anything that's physical, get anything physical out of there. And it's going to get in, everything off the floor, sweeping. Once that's all done, it's going to be spraying with a bleach solution everywhere. Or mop first, and then spraying with bleach solution. Okay. Um, and then cleaning the fans, change my AC filter, because I have uh, roll off, roll on, or actual AC in there, air right. handler. Yep. Um, and then just really sitting in there for like 20 minutes and just look around and see if I heard anything. Right. You brought up some good stuff. A lot of the same stuff I do. Anybody else have anything different that they do? It feels important.
Yeah, biggest biggest thing in rooms are, are going to be filters, all your dehu and air filters. Um, common common thing I see some people overlook too, and a lot of this is, you know, stuff again that may be common knowledge to some of you, but even filters. Um, you know, when you're spraying, always make sure to turn off your dehus. I can't tell you how many times I've been in people's rooms and I look at their dehu filters and they're just oil stained. And a lot of people don't think to go manually shut their dehus off when they foliar spray. If you're foliar spraying oils in your rooms, make sure you're you're shutting your dehus off. I usually leave them off after I foliar spray for about you know usually five to ten minutes to let everything settle before I turn my my, my units back on. If you have HVAC units inside the room, same thing um, because it will just suck up all that oil. Um, but yeah, oil or um, sorry filters, changing them out, um, cleaning, sanitizing, obviously getting the debris out of the room. Um, I'm a proponent of using chlorine dioxide, which this is a product that contains chlorine dioxide um, at the end after I scrub and clean everything. Um, I like running uh, ozone as well, and typically I'll clean and sanitize my entire room. I'll run chlorine dioxide and I'll uh, turn on all my HVAC, all my filters, everything, and let that room circulate for about 24 hours. If you're running an HPS room and you've had issues you know, from time to time with bugs, or let's say you had a run where you were facing bugs um, and you have an HVS room and your, eight and your infrastructure is able to handle it, I would heat the hell out of that room. We have some rooms will bring up to like 130, 140 degrees, turn on all the lights, all the HVAC, turn off all the AC and just bake that entire room out. Um, it's 136 degrees is the exact number over that. You're going to kill most all mold spores as well as bugs, you know, larva, things like that. Um, if you're, you know, if you're in the caregiver market, you're constantly having issues with, with bugs in your rooms, I would suggest using some sort of, they make a variety uh, of pyrethrin bombs that you can put in your room to run um, at reset. I would suggest doing that. Larva is something that can, you know, if you're not changing out filters, they can harbor in there. You know, bug larva, if you have benches in your rooms, making sure that every surface is getting wiped down. Um, you know, if you're not seeing issues in your rooms, a recess can go very quick and very painless. It, it, usually, I'm going very overboard if I, if I saw issues during that room, in that room during that run. I'll, I'll go a little above and beyond. So, uh, but yeah, taking that time. Another thing that we don't talk, you know, some drains. You have drains. Making sure you're cleaning the drains in your rooms. I like to flush out all my HVAC. I'm um, sorry, all my dehu piping as well. I like to maintenance out any humidifiers. I like to maintenance out any. Um, uh, uh, not cell pumps, uh, condensate pumps, you know, get, get inside those, clean those, any tubing, all my PVC lines, uh, clean them out for the HVAC, make sure my dehus are going to be able to keep running so I don't get clogged up next round. Uh, obviously wiping down all the walls, I take apart all my fans, wipe down all the fans, um, anywhere there's, if you got Schaefer fans in your rooms, they're just, they're bug splatter 101 against the wall where they're at, you'll just see like dead gnats plastered to the side of the wall where you're your fans are getting all that kind of stuff cleaned up um, and then really uh, sterilizing cleaning your, your air ducting and all that your uh, mini split heads definitely got to be cleaned out 100% every single time um, and uh, running some sort of you know air sanitizer it's like chlorine dioxide that's just what I use so anything else people are doing out there that's helpful for the group I think you see a lot of those Yeah. You know, IBM cleaning. I do. I, I, I like what you said. We brought it up about you know the room stuff with the uh, high rate frame and polvers for any people that do have lung issues. Yeah. Even if you don't, you know it's it's, a, it's safe. You know what I mean? Clean out your room. Make sure you ain't got the lights in there. Stuff at all. Yeah. They probably make you too. They're off your AC. Turn the lights up high. Shut all the doors. Come yep. back a couple hours and it's fucking 150 or whatever. Love it. I have uh, melted some PVC yeah. Yeah. yeah, you'll get it so hot that like if you have rubber made barrels in there, it'll just like you can like just barely tap them, it'll just like fold down to the ground. Yeah, baking a room is, is huge. Make sure your infrastructure can handle it. Don't burn down your house or you know, call me back and be like, bro, I melted my <laughs> down. Um you know, but yeah, it's definitely I think we covered almost anything. I know we're we're a little over our time limit. I'm gonna hang out for a while. Um, yeah, keep talking.
guys. Yeah, yeah sure. there's food everywhere in the building. Yeah, I should my screen, you guys. I got some TV ice cream if anybody wants it. Nice, bro. Uh, my throat could use it. I'm down. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, appreciate that. Yeah, yeah we'll, we'll hang out. We'll talk for a while. I'll be around for a little bit. It was great seeing all you guys. I love, I love talking shop. Um, love to hear more about what you guys got going on. So, so guys, let's, what do we owe Bitmaster? Big thank you. Round of applause. Appreciate you, brother. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you.